This episode marks the 175th edition of China Talk. I've been making shows for over four years now and have no plans to slow down. Thank you all so much for your support and encouragement over these years. In the coming weeks, you're going to start hearing ads dynamically inserted into the show. I don't want to put anything behind a paywall, as I see China Talk first and foremost as an educational project, but I also want to be able to put this show on solid financial footing. Don't like ads and want to support the show? Well, for the next two weeks, you can get yourself an ad-free subscription for just $5 a month. That's four to six episodes a month of the best English language conversations on China, all ad-free. Your money will par partially go towards paying China Talk's first hire, Kaylin Quinn, who is already doing a tremendous job raising the quality of the podcast and newsletter, and financially supporting the cast of contributors to the China Talk newsletter. Please go to patreon.com slash China Talk and give what you can. Do note that for everyone supporting China Talk via Glow and Substack, I'll also be able to get you ad-free feeds as well. All right, on with the show. So Adam, I hear you've been um, listening to some old China Talk episodes, and you mentioned that you had some issues with uh, something that my boss said. Well, it was his uh, Dan was giving an account of, as it were, uh, how the China narrative is run, and his basic shtick was: look, the Communist Party had screwed everything up so badly by the early 1980s that all they had to do was stand back and let things run, because at that point Chinese GDP per capita was lower than that of Nicaragua. Obviously, you could see the force of that point. But I happened to have been reading that day the first. Report report on China done by the World Bank in 1983, which sets the stage for their incredibly harmonious relationship over the following decade. So harmonious that it's suspicious to some people, but nevertheless, serious outside agency that comes in, spends some time trying to actually get a baseline of where China is start from with its reform program. And it's absolutely fascinating reading because this group of World Bank economists, experienced development economists, take a look at China, a sustained and serious look at China, conclude that it is in a vastly more favorable place than any other low-income developing country they've looked at up to that point. The key metrics for them are human development, so much higher levels of elementary education, much better levels of basic public health provision, middle-income country levels of both, similar to literacy. And then actually, it's not just, as it were, soft tissue human development index. It's actually also the state of Chinese agriculture at that point, which on key metrics of agricultural modernization, like the deployment of artificial fertilizer, something people in the 80s used in a fairly uninhibited way, was again streets ahead of any of its competitors. And the obvious comparison is, of course, with India, which is in a completely different league of underdevelopment by comparison with China on all of these metrics. Decades less in terms of life expectancy, vastly higher infant mortality, much more primitive education system, about, about half the level of literacy that China has. And so at that point, from the point of view of the World Bank, it seemed that the communist regime, for all of the violence and the millions of tens of millions of people whose lives it had claimed, had nevertheless laid the foundation for what looked like rapid growth. So contrary to the argument that there was nothing there and the communist regime needed to stand back, the argument of the World Bank was, no, this is a growth miracle waiting to happen. They need to tinker with policy here or there, they literally say this, and then we expect over the next couple of decades China to leap forward into an unprecedented degree. That was their assessment in 83. The reason why I have a lot of sympathy for Dan's point is because if you look at the level of Chinese GDP relative to, say, like the U.S., it was unusually depressed. And I think the reason for, this is where I think Adam is absolutely right, is it's not because there was these human capital issues that you might have seen in other poor countries, but because you have 140 plus year period of more or less constant violence, either externally or internally. And that led to significant underinvestment in physical capital. So even if you had a lot of the sort of fundamental social human capital elements that would have led to a successful society, there's never was a chance to deploy it because of underinvestment. And so from that perspective, and this is where I think Dan gets a selling point, it's like once that stops, so you stop having imperialist invasion, you stop having the Japanese invasion, you stop having civil war, you stop having the upheaval of Mao, that's where things come into play. And then the question I think that I'm not feel comfortable people adjudicating, but is to what extent was it the communists after 49 that you have the higher level of human development relative to the level of physical capital? Or was it a whole long train of things that preceded that for hundreds of years? And that's where my, my guess is it's probably a mix of both, but I think that's where Hamburg can sort of reconcile these stories and why a lot of the growth that we've seen since the late seventies and early eighties is yes, the communist party made a lot of choices. And we talked about in our book about turbocharged fiscal investment, 
but a lot of things probably would have expected, I think, just with the arrival of peace domestically and internationally to have this really big positive change. I take, I take a lot of Bat's points and um, seem to me entirely convincing and, and clearly the end of violence, whether externally driven or internally driven through revolutionary people is a crucial precondition. But the story isn't, after all, unique to China. If you look across Eastern Europe, if you look at the Soviet Union itself, one thing the state socialist communist party led regimes did do in all of those places is transfer societies with very low levels of human capital even as late as 1945 50 into societies with much higher levels of human capital capital 25 to 30 years later this is true for bulgaria romania for the territory of the soviet union itself and it's not surprising because it was their declared intention and they actually did deliver on it and that's just not true for countries like india which may have had declarations like this at the time of independence but signally failed to deliver all the way down to the present day on those basic preconditions so the argument i think is not, of course, that China doesn't have that history of retardation that begins in the 18th and 19th century, or that the gap isn't at its largest. I wholly agree, right? But because of the sustained growth in the West, the gap numerically is going to be largest by the 1970s. This is true for the Zen third world in general. But there is just this huge difference between China and countries which in 1945 looked quite similar to China by 1983. And that isn't accidental. And the World Bank doesn't think it's accidental. And the World Bank doesn't at that moment open up any counterfactual, which is perhaps not surprising because these are official communications they have to agree on. And one shouldn't discount the modernizing ambition of the nationalist regime before 1945. And in a sense, this goes rather well with a subsequent guest or a previous guest that Jordan had on Roselle, uh, the labor economist, development economist from Stanford, who was making the very apt point that clearly China now has the problem, that in a sense, many of those structures and investments that were marked it as very different from your average low-income developing country in the early 1980s, were in a sense continued on for decades, or in some cases actually deteriorated from their condition in the early 1980s. I think there's a story there about healthcare and its deterioration through to the early 2000s that now will potentially jeopardize China's further growth, now it's reached middle income status, right? So in a sense, the growth rate at one point, he says China just grew too fast. And what I took that to mean is essentially it outgrew the structures of education and healthcare, the basic human capital formation mechanisms that enabled that leap into uh, low skill manufacturing so dramatically in the 90s, 2000s and into the 20 teens. And now the regime faces a huge challenge. And I guess the question is, does it have the capacities to mobilize anymore? Can it actually reached out deep into Chinese society to create that base, because I thought his points were very powerful about that being the central question, right? If this is a supposedly long-lived authoritarian regime with a long time horizon, you'd expect them to be particularly good at investing in the high payoff investments, early childhood education. Everyone knows that's where you get the biggest bang for buck. They ought to be able to assimilate that logic. But for all the reasons he mentioned, that's actually quite difficult for China as well. And it's right. difficult for the US also. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Now, this is always the assumed contrast. The really glaring failure is obviously a massively more affluent society, which critically underspends on early childhood education. And if you, there's no mystery as to why America is unequal as it is. It's not even hiding. It's just there in plain sight. Jason Furman tweeted out this meme of there's this fight over the new infrastructure bill. Should we fund it fully? Should you use dynamic scoring? Well, what if the returns are positive? What does that mean? Is that infinite? Should we keep doing it? Spending being this scary thing, like a, an investment growth mindset is not something I can't remember the last time we've had a Congress which sort of internalized that. Well, Jason's absolutely great on all of these issues. He made that brilliant point a couple of years ago in a paper where he said the, the sole objective of American macroeconomic policy at this point setting aside the Klein kink is redistribution. Given the way in which the incomes of median Americans have not totally stagnated, but how slowly they've grown, not since 2006, but since the mid-1970s, in terms of actually right. benefiting the majority of Americans, the all of American policy ought to be about distribution and not overall growth, because that's right. where you really get the, the big payoff from. And for that, clearly supporting families. This is why the Biden families plan was absolutely excellent policy. That's exactly where they should have put the emphasis. Yeah, I remember writing about that paper when he presented a few years ago. And basically, it's, yeah, you look at someone on the very top of the U.S. income distribution, they've had sort of China-like growth for the past yeah. 40 years. Probably explains a degree of optimism and everyone else has had a very, a lot of people have negative or zero. And so that explains it. But you know, just going briefly back on, on the China point, I think that despite the stereotypes that people have about authoritarian regimes having a long time horizon, I'm sure you also have reason to be skeptical of how that plays out in, in practice. But in the Chinese case, this is something that Michael's a lot, we talked about in our book, the growth model that was so successful in the past four 
40 years, or not maybe not the whole 40 years, but for a bunch of that time since 78, and particularly since 89, that model created a set of entrenched political and economic interests that benefit from the emphasis on investment in physical capital rather than human capital. And so those people then become an impediment to the transition that everyone, including ostensibly the top leadership of the Communist Party, all says is what they want to do. This is not a controversial point, but Michael and I write it. It's in the 2013 plenum, but that there should be more focus on raising living standards for improving healthcare quality and things of that nature. And yet it doesn't happen, which I think is a very interesting and revealing fact about how the political economy works, even if we don't necessarily see all exactly how the mechanisms that make it work that way, the way you can in a, a place like the U.S. where it's more transparent. Clearly, you look at the end results and that tells you something I think really important. And unfortunately, it makes me wonder whether or not, even though we think this is all a good thing, we think it's a good thing, they think it's a good thing, that there is the scope for the improvement. Or if, in fact, you are just going to see sustained underdevelopment of the countryside in the way that the children having living with worms and so forth. I thought it was really fascinating to learn about the decentralization of education spending and health spending in China as well. I mean, that, that's just a recipe for cumulative causation in this respect, like poor places stay poor because they can't raise the funds to invest. And if that structural logic is operating very powerfully in the United States, it's also clearly operating very powerfully in China. Did you guys hear the Larry Summers one? I'm curious. If yeah, you I did. Exactly. I did. I actually had a kind of epiphany about why secular stagnation, because, you know, the obvious answer to secular stagnation is what the hell are you talking about? There's obviously this society is growing so fast. But when you think about the, his elucidation was, I thought, very compelling, very much along Matt and Michael's lines, actually. And also the macroeconomics are Significant, right? You know, if China is running the kind of uh, saving surplus that it is, the net flow of capital is out of China. So it doesn't actually produce the opportunity for investors to, on net, you, you can't buy into the Chinese miracle. Individual investors can, but on net, Chinese capital is flowing out. Capital isn't flowing in. Yeah, I think secular stagnation, I know he's gotten the flag for a lot of things over the years, which has come from me, but I think that particular, the secular stagnation argument that he presented, I guess it was 2013 or whatever, 13. I think makes a lot of sense. And it's continued. I don't think it fits. With, I think arguably that secular stagnation view that he's had, I think, undermines some of the criticisms he's had more recently of U.S. macro policy. There may be a tidy consistency problem then. So Matt, I hear you have some news. Yes, I just recently launched a subscription newsletter called The Overshoot. It started about a week and a half ago, and I'm very excited. It's ironic, Matt, isn't it? It's called The, the Overshoot because your striking opening graph is actually all about the undershoot, which immediately got the nerd juices flowing. You've got uh, American GDP per capita and uh, the risk really shocking deviation from post-World War II trend in growth of GDP per capita in the United States. It's substack with a mission. Yes, that's right. So basically the chart that I have in that first piece that I'm describing is a chart showing how much the average American produced each year from 1947 until now. And what's really striking is that from 1947 until 2006, you see this very steady increase, about 2.2% each year. And there's variation around that, obviously, with business cycles, recessions, and, and booms, and, and so forth. But a remarkably stable trend until you get to 2006. And then you have the financial crisis. And what happens is, first of all, you have a pretty severe downturn, although it's not unprecedented. But what's really striking is then you have this incredibly sluggish recovery. And that persisted all the way until the eve of the pandemic. And so what ended up happening is that relative to this long-term, remarkably stable trend, stable in the face of a lot of different shifts in productivity, and demographics and so forth, but still a very stable trend that you have a 14% gap between where Americans would have been and where they actually were by the eve of the pandemic. And so that is this big undershoot. It's a phenomenon we've seen globally. You see it in Europe, you see it for the world as a whole, but the data we have go back for this for the US. And the thing I think that would be really nice to try is maybe we can not do that. Maybe we can instead <laughs> not just try to get back to that trend line, but even see what happens if we go beyond it. Because I think one of the things we've learned, especially during the pandemic, but also for other people's research, and I think actually some of what Adam has done in terms of looking at mobilization economies and what other people have done in this research is that we think of for what an economy can produce is not some static fixed thing. There are hard limits in terms of number of people and so forth, but there's a lot of flexibility there, a lot of ingenuity and adaptability on the part of businesses and workers. And we never get a chance to see what that is unless we really push that limit. And so that is where the name, the overshoot comes from. Yes, yeah, the Verdun's law, isn't it? This idea that rates of productivity growth are causally related to rates of growth. So if you manage mm -hmm. to grow faster and push the envelope, the dynamics all begin to go in the right direction. People often quote economies like the Danish economy as models of this, though whether or not you can extrapolate from a country the size of Denmark with all of the advantages it has to big continental economies like the US is open to question. But maybe I guess you could see that kind of logic operating at least in regional economies in the US as well. High growth areas drive high productivity growth in a kind of virtuous circle. There's the productivity. There's also the extent to which there's so much extant capacity I think we didn't necessarily appreciate. So one of the things that I find really striking was looking at the 
pandemic is that we've seen U.S. consumer demand for durable goods up about you know 40% in real terms since the start of the pandemic, which is remarkable. And yes, there are stories of various supply bottlenecks and delivery slowdowns and some price increases. But on the whole, considering we're talking about a 40% increase in the span of a year and a half, remarkably little disruption. And that's really striking. And it gives you a sense of you know, how much other latent potential is there that we have yet to exploit. I think looking at the 30s and 40s, which I did before in my, in my previous job, and I'll probably keep looking, obviously Adam's looked at this a lot, what the US economy, people were thinking about in terms of the state of how close to maximum the US economy is running on the eve of World War II. And that turned out to just be a vast underestimate. And the US admittedly was had a sort of exceptional experience. But still, it's very striking that you get to the 1940, people thought they were about as recovered as they could be. And then you have economic output double in the years after that. Maybe that was exceptional, but I think it's also really interesting to what extent have we not really tried to, to do that sort of thing. Let's make the, the future different. It might not be necessarily perfect, but at least it'll be different. And maybe, maybe there will be some real improvements we can have compared to yeah. the past uh, 15 years. I was going to add the social justice dimension to this, which is really manifest in the American case, because when we talk about the slack that we don't know exists, what we're actually talking about is the labor of those most precarious and most disadvantaged in the labor market more often than not. And one of the really striking things, of course, about the US war economy in World War II was that it integrated women into the workforce at a really dramatic rate. That's where a lot of that extra capacity came from on the workforce side. And of course, it also accelerated the migration of black families out of the South into the new hubs of production in the North and in California. Not that was without tensions, but it changes the social structure as well. That kind of pattern of accelerated growth. I think this idea of there like being these bounds you don't even realize until you hit a crisis. And then you're like, oh, wait, why are we doing this? You quoted Paul Krugman at some point saying that if we knew Martians were going to be here in three years, we would have full employment in two weeks because there wouldn't be any qualms about freaking out about inflation or what have you. Adam, you've been making this argument uh, in podcasts about how investments in science is the least painful way to go about potentially bending that productivity curve and putting that kink into a straighter. But the fact that the size of investments, even when we're finally talking about it with the Endless Frontier Turn Competition Act, really could be orders of magnitudes higher. And it is striking to me that even in this sort of post-COVID being scared of China moment that we're still not seeing the sort of level of rethinks, which I think is necessary to do the sort of investments that are going to fill that 15% gap. Absolutely. To me, that's the eco-modernist side of my persona is that I just don't get if we are gambling as heavily as we appear to be gambling on science and technology to provide us with the silver bullets to deal with the sort of environmental anthropocenic challenges that lie ahead. The example of 2020 being these miraculous vaccine production programs. You'd think if we were serious about that, and that really was ultimately our solution. And I do take the failure of shutdown measures in general to be a pretty good sign, if you like, of things to come with regard to climate as well. We desperately need these technical solutions. It's also bipartisan. If the GOP has a climate policy in the good old days with Bush Jr., that's what it was. You'd think that we'd be serious about it, in which case we'd be spending 10 times as much as we currently are. My, For me, it's always the pet food test. Americans spend $35 billion a year on pet food and treats. And we don't come close to that kind of spending on adventurous energy research. We're talking about two related but slightly different things, which is the supply side of the economy and the demand side. And these are clearly linked, as Adam was saying, that the more you push demand, the more we can expect to generate productivity increases in response. A lot of what we saw in terms of why the U.S. economy underperformed, and the global economy, not just the U.S., the global economy underperformed, what people were expecting before the financial crisis, a demand side phenomenon. And sometimes people attribute it to productivity because they sort of distinguish these things. The difference is inflation and inflation is, seems to always be 2% regardless. But these two important things, and I think what you both are saying, there's a great line and I feel bad I can't remember who said it. To spend money, you have to spend money, which is if you want to really support <laughs> a lot of demand, you need to make sure you invest in the capacity to produce the things so that you don't have inflation. And I think that's, I think that's really ties in what you guys are saying, that it's really important to have that research and that, that capex. Matt, did you shit post? NATO for trade into existence? I don't know if I'd call it shitposting, but it's, uh, and I don't know if it exists, but I mean, it's an interesting question. The way this started was I saw there's some FT headline on Twitter about how China was effectively blockading Australian wine. And I joked, oh, we need a strategic Shiraz reserve. And then you said that was actually a good idea. And I thought about it, but like, hey, this could be a kind of a fun topic for a column. And then I wrote the column, and then apparently other people like it metastasized, and now it's an idea. TPP was NATO for trade, right? At least everyone thought TPP was well, NATO for trade. Yeah. The specific idea here is that you want to sustain demand in case 
someone decides to essentially boycott you. Oh, so it's like a sort of common agricultural policy meets the... Yeah, I mean, like, the specific idea literally was the US government basically promised to buy as much Australian wine as necessary to make up for any shortfall in Chinese demand or front the Australian government the money to do that or whatever. You can think of it as, like, swap lines type situation. Actually, wine works really well because it's a storable commodity. So that was the idea. Like, why not? You can make some kind of... There's a trade to be done there. And especially if the argument is that the Chinese government is doing something that Chinese households aren't particularly thrilled about but in order to make a political point if they find the political point doesn't work because Australian producers can just keep it in storage and it's fine you wouldn't want a situation where the US is permanently subsidizing Australian wine growers but as a sort of a way of deterrence and you'd think in the first instance it would simply be Canberra's job if they want autonomy versus China they would need to be the primary holder of the buffer they could do that but that in so doing they could only substitute for the lost income in Australian dollar terms but to the extent that it's an export that generated hard currency you'd have a depreciation effect the neater solution would presumably be in the uh, unlikely event that Australia runs out of dollars again classic kind of 1930s world we would do some sort of um, swap deal. I mean, the problem of, with those kind of schemes is that the Californian wine producers will demand exactly the same thing. If it's in response to a specific geopolitical action, then you know that can be time limited in that way. But yeah, obviously, otherwise you'd have a very strange situation where people who make a lot of money would be getting sort of permanent government handouts, which is not what most people consider optimal policy. <laughs> that would be just like agricultural policy in general all of the time then. Yes. Between 1937 and the collapse of the nationalist regime in the spring of 1949, China experienced an inflation surge that is among the worst ever recorded. Tell me more. If you look at the list of great hyperinflations, one tends to think perhaps of Weimar, Zimbabwe, Venezuela more recently. But if you draw that list on something like a kind of logarithmic graph, the Chinese hyperinflation is amongst the worst ever. And it transpired basically as a result of the impact of the prolonged and often in the West underrated struggle between the nationalist regime in China. I think it's worth emphasizing that it was predominantly the nationalist side that, that fought this war. And the Japanese, which destabilized the very, very fragile Chinese Republican state by 1945. And then as the nationalists tumbled forward after, well, in earnest after 46 into the civil war with the communists, things completely break down. And by 1949, you have, in fact, by 1948, you have Weimar style scenes of people carting wheelbarrow loads of banknotes through the streets of Shanghai. So it's, I think, in the order of, it's 123 times 10 to the power of 12. So I think that's 123 three trillion fold inflation of the 1937 price level. And I believe the Weimar one is 10 to the trillion or maybe even just one trillion fold. So in any case, you know, you could say at this point, there's not much difference how far you're wiped out. Is it, am, I, am I a trillion fold or a hundred trillion times wiped out? <laughs> you're getting very close to zero yeah. in either case, but it's extremely severe and significantly absent from the historical imagination in the West. So reading um, Isabella Weber's new book on the politics of price decontrol in China in the 19th 1980s, she refers to this example. My curiosity was piqued. I edited the Cambridge History of World War II with Michael Geyer a few years back, and we had a great contribution from a historian at Oxford called Huff that dealt with the broader monetary politics of World War II in, in Asia, and he had uh, kind of alerted me to this problem. And I thought it was just a, a great thing to do. A, I, my own newsletter about actually, the, which which isn't behind a paywall, but is out there, chart book newsletter. And one of the amazing things is that Life magazine sent Cartier Bresson, the great photographer, to Shanghai high in the fall of 48. So we have these truly iconic images of a hyperinflation shot by not just the random street photographers that captured the Weimar Republic with inflation, but by no less a figure than Henri Cartier-Bresson. So there's images of this in the MoMA, it turns out. <laughs> As an economic historian who loves art history, it's great to discover that link once again. You know, that episode's really interesting because it does fit in as sort of the broader theme of people who, I think, follow this stuff more closely, is that you have these hyperinflations as a consequence of broader social breakdown, often in the consequence context of war revolution losing a war in particular and so i think that really it may not be part of the broader historical imagination but along with the other less well-known ones like you know hungary in 1919 or hungary again after world war ii actually or i guess north korea i think in the 90s like these are situations that maybe don't get as much attention but they all do fit this common theme and on the other hand like it also makes clear that talk about hyperinflation in any other context really is bonkers we've got 99 problems but that isn't one but the prospect of like us suddenly sliding into a hyperinflationary situation is just completely unreal and it should be an acid test of somebody's seriousness if they go to that kind of place fiat money is no doubt disconcerting but the extraordinary thing about it is that almost all the time except in 
situations of absolutely massive societal stress, we don't go anywhere near hyperinflation. There is some debate recently about whether the term fiat money is helpful or not. Or, and I actually think this is a good example of how it is a good term because think about what fiat refers to. We're talking about the law and the power of the state. And this is exactly why as long as you think that is basically holding, then you can actually have yeah. pretty good confidence in your money. On the other hand, if that breaks down, that's when it breaks. I think people use it as a pejorative, oh, it's fiat money. But I don't know, it's actually pretty useful. <laughs> Yeah, try try having money without it would be my recommendation. Right. It's like, right. Money with no fiat is a pretty disconcerting. I've often tried to issue two's coins to, and choose money to undergraduates and have never found any takers. But more seriously, in the Chinese case as well, it's very fascinating to see how halting it is, right? So you can literally map, this is true of the Weimar Republic as well. Milton Friedman may not be wrong that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, but it's also true that not all monetary phenomena are inflationary. And even in a situation where you have a massively escalating escalating monetary issuance by a highly stressed state. You don't necessarily get a smooth straight line escalation in prices at all. And so early on in the inflation, because you can make a bet the other way, right? If you actually trust in the government in the longer run, you buy it cheap and sell it high. So in fact, in the Weimar inflation and also in the Chinese one, there are moments where people are hoarding the currency in the expectation of a future stabilization. So this actually sustains the nationalists in the first phase of the war against China, where there's a big patriotic rally and people will hold the nationalist currency through to about 39 and this is where we then get into conversations with the MMT crowd because it gets interesting to know what are the shocks which destabilize that confident consensus and something like a harvest failure which is what happened in the nationalist regime's area of control in 1940 though it's sort of to a clean-minded macroeconomist that can't be a driver of inflation right because how could a single commodities price variation drive a general change in prices if what it does is unleash a panic it can very well have that effect that's what we saw in 1940 in the nationalist area of zone, a harvest failure, a simultaneous effort of mobilization by the regime because they decided they're going to have to fight a long war. And then the news of the terrifying Japanese advances over the winter of 41-42. And that's where the inflation clearly begins to escalate. In the end, it's bonkers. In the end, the regime in 48 is so desperate, they decide they'll introduce a new currency, they make a clean start, very Bitcoin-y, there'll only be an issuance of 200 million, it'll be gold back. And then they just blow it. Two weeks later, they're issuing three times as much and you're off to the races again. In the meantime, they'd use the very terrifying secret police of the nationalist regime in Shanghai to drum up about $170 million worth of hard currency and gold because you're going to back a currency like that with forced conversion of everyone's private gold and foreign currency holdings into the national reserve and of course those people end up just having been expropriated yeah. because they handed over their private assets at the nominal exchange rate in August and by November it's dead so that's the background to these Cartier-Bresson images of people who've just effectively been expropriated to the tune of 170 million dollars which is a lot of money at that point in Shanghai. Yeah that point about confidence reminds me of stuff that I, I read about in, in the economist of the U.S. Civil War, where the value of you know Union greenbacks fluctuated depending on how people thought the war was going, and obviously the Confederate that stuff became utterly worthless as another forgotten hyperinflation. I'd be curious how Adam, I'm sure you know all about this, but what was going on in in Japan over the same period because that probably maybe yeah. not have been a hyperinflation, but probably an interesting story there. I don't actually know about the oh. Japanese side of this. On the German side, you see exactly that kind of trajectory during World War II that bank deposits and the willingness to make bank deposits depends quite critically on people's assumptions about the future of the regime, unsurprisingly. And certainly from the summer of 44 onwards, where you've got this cataclysmic escalation of bad news, the silent financing mechanism that operated previously, where basically the government, in a modern style, doesn't do operatic, big public bond issuance. It just siphons it out, the money it needs, out of the collective pools of, of saving. That begins to break down because people are realising the game is up and they're putting their cash or whatever else. They're turning their cash into hard values and they're sticking whatever they then can under the pillow. But even in the Chinese case, people on Twitter were really helpful in suggesting new lines of, of argument here. And early on, the nationalist folks who are, we think of them as sort of Chiang Kai-shek as this sort of feckless, corrupt. But that isn't how, as it were, at the time that the nationalist mm -hmm. regime understood itself at all. It was a modernizing nationalist state building regime. And they're actually coming off a, a major effort to centralize the Chinese monetary system, which culminates in 35 with not just the creation of a central bank dates to 28 in the Republic, but consolidation of a silver-backed currency issued by three banks, the Central Bank, the Bank of China, and the Communications Bank. And they actually celebrate the early phases of monetary financing as testimony to the success of their modernization of the Chinese financial system. For them, that move into an elastic fiat money regime was a sign of how modern they were, not a sign of a slippery slope to disaster. They just had the misfortune of them being invaded 
yeah. of losing rather badly to the Japanese right. for a long time and not... I was struck by how modest, in fact, in the end, in financial terms, the scale of American aid was. It, I guess they figured that the nationalist regime couldn't actually usefully use more than they provided, but compared to what they're pumping into the British war effort, it's trivial, it's peanuts. It's an interesting counterfactual what would have happened if the US had treated the nationalists the way they treated the British and the, the Soviets, because presumably that would have also helped in the Civil War change that outcome potentially, which is certainly an interesting counterfactual. I'm sure there was a racial component to it. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but also that I don't think the nationalists fail in the Civil War for lack of supplies. The stories I remember of caddy peasant communist armies surrounding the amply equipped armoured divisions of the nationalists fighting them at close quarters. I don't think it's a lack of materiel that makes the difference there. That's where I think the inflation story is a key part. And there's certainly, for me, of course, and for us in general, and this is the way that Isabel Weber was using it as well, the significance of all of this is that in the mindset of the Communist Party ruling class, one of the reasons they think they prevailed is that, as Lenin said, the best way to destroy a bourgeois society is to unleash inflation. Or at least this is apocryphally, this is attributed to Lenin by Keynes, and there's actually a kind of minor literature about whether Lenin actually ever said it. But in any case, the Chinese Communist Party understands this perhaps surprisingly to western eyes they think of themselves as a force for monetary stabilization so this is true actually of the bolsheviks as well who introduced the gold standard after the chaos of the civil right. war in the soviet union and of course has a very enduring significance for the politics and the political economy of the regime through the crises of the late 1980s and then all the way down to the present and i think a lot of this conversation was triggered by the fact that you see the people pboc and other spokespeople in china right now positioning themselves as the sort of conservative antidote to qe you know, the corrupt, degenerate financial systems of the West, which China is now showing up. And there was that weird moment last year when yield chasing bondholders in the West were piling into Chinese sovereign debt because it seemed to offer a gate combination of steady positive yields. As you were alluding to, and one of the things that I found really striking in, in the book that I wrote with Michael Pettis, one of the things that was happening in the late 1980s in China was that you had these changes in relative prices because of the liberalization of the countryside relative to the city. And that led to 20 to 30% inflation for urban residents. And that was pretty dramatic and destabilizing. And that, I think, definitely contributed to both the yeah. uh, political unrest and then the violence of the crackdown that, that followed because they were afraid of that deal stabilization. And also, as you said, it's interesting how the recognition that inflation is destabilizing does carry over to other authoritarian regimes. I mean, Stalin, I'm sure other people have written about this, but I remember seeing this in, in Kotkin's biography a few years ago that there's this debate in the 1920s about economic policy in the Soviets. And there's basically an MMT side, which is we should create money and keep everyone in full employment. And then there's this other hard money side of we have to maintain a balance of payments and maintain the gold reserves and balance budgets and Stalin was the powerful person he, he sided with the, the other uh, that second group but it's kind of interesting how that plays out it doesn't fit I think the narratives we have in the democratic west about economic policy and ideology even Napoleon right mm. in a sense maybe Napoleon is the archetype for this kind of post-revolutionary stabilizing authoritarianism and he also mm -hmm. introduced a stable franc which basically saw the French bourgeoisie through the 19th century that's where the kind of rentier ideology in France is anchored is in the inflation the hyperinflation of the revolutionary period which was one of the first revolutionary experiments with paper money as part of a political program of mobilization mm -hmm. and then one of Bonaparte's promises is of monetary stabilization in the aftermath. But there's a really fascinating trade-off, isn't there, between the triumphalist democratic debtor narrative, the glorious revolution, the stabilization of currency and financial systems around the representation of bondholders in parliament, on the one hand, which is a very powerful narrative which drives a lot of economic and political thinking from the late 17th century all the way down to Neil Ferguson, North and Weingast, people like that in the present. And on the other hand, this sort of the authoritarian version, in other words, an authoritarian decision maker with a long time horizon is a better guarantor of monetary and financial stability. And you that playing out very markedly in the 20s and 30s. It's quite fascinating, that politics. The fiat conversation kind of comes back again because if you have a really legitimate state that actually voluntarily commands the respect of the people, you can get away with a lot more. And if you don't, then you have to pick one of those extremes. What the nationalist regime in China started out being able to do, so after the Northern Expedition, it's really striking. So by 28, 29, when they're establishing their grip, setting up the central bank, the acid test is can they borrow domestically in their own currency because that's the bit of borrowing which is most vulnerable to devaluation and the answer is they could quite successfully until 32 when they carried out the first bond reorganization and then I think 35 or 36 they did another one and that then rather unsurprisingly destroys their credit yeah. so during the war they're never able to launch a bond 
a significant bond. That is a sort of benchmark of where you stand. Between 20 and 32, they lose all of Manchuria. So that's a big... Yes, so it's a, it's a big piece of the, the underlying macro, the underlying economy, what can service these, which is going to generate the tax revenue that would allow you to service yeah. these debts, is, has shifted. But nevertheless, so through that first phase, there's really a wave of enthusiasm. And that's an interesting feature of finance in China's history generally, right? That the politics of debts is not just at the peak level. It's in a broader sense within the political class, which is evidently a tiny fraction of China's immense population, most of whom are peasants and are illiterate and don't have access to this at all. But within the political class in the cities, and this is true of many of the, say, we say, emerging market economies of 1900, Iran, Ottoman Empire, even Russia to a certain extent, Egypt, like the politics of debt, international debt. Debt reorganization is one of the key instruments of imperial rule from the outside. And whether or not in a very reminiscent of today, whether or not you can organize a powerful and rich domestic bond market is critical to sovereignty as understood from the top, but also nationalist commitment from the bottom. People will subscribe to this stuff out of patriotism so as to free their governments from the constraints of external debt. So that's a very interesting factor. And as it were, very significant that by 1940, essentially, the nationalists had expired all of their goodwill. No one in China in their right mind would lend to them anymore. Not directly, not by way of a government bond. Adam, is heroic Heroic discourse dead. And is that a problem? Heroic discourse isn't dead. What's more interesting, I think, is whether or not there is any longer a politics of organized sacrifice. If this is a question, for instance, which is elucidated and thrown into quite sharp relief by the shocks of last year, most societies could agree that heroism was the appropriate description for doctors and nurses in the front line. Having talked to some doctors, and their families. It's pretty clear it wasn't obvious to them that heroism was required of them. Folks who weren't in the right branch of medicine did not feel it was necessarily their obligation to show up at hospital and work whatever shifts are required. And then, of course, the question was, and we celebrated that with the pan banging and clapping in many cities around the world throughout the pandemic. But then all of the interesting questions start about who else could be enrolled in that kind of discourse. In China, classically, you've got the folks in Wuhan, the old gents sitting in 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 their hospital beds on their own, giving Communist Party salutes, committing themselves and their bodies to the national struggle, which is, as it were, the cliched version. But then how far does that really carry over and how do you extend it to the economy at large, to other domains of social life? And I think most of us felt to say that we should die for the economy, take the risk of death for the economy, was a sort of obscene absurdity last year. But if you think about World War II, for instance, people died for the economy all the time. It was completely normal. You went out to do your work for the national war of it and if you were bombed then you were a hero and that's what happened and people took it with stoicism and that was a logic that actually worked. I'm not saying it was totally consensual because we know that muckraking histories of World War II show very clearly that it's certainly in Britain the idea of that kind of blitz spirit is a fantasy but at least it was a self-sustaining fantasy and it doesn't seem to me that we were able to muster that last year in a coherent way. That then makes decision making quite difficult under conditions of say a pandemic. There was a Tyler Cowen article which was making the argument that the fact the fact that the West was able to let hundreds of thousands, now millions of people die over the course of 2020 was actually a signal to China that we weren't as soft as they may have thought we were. And on the one hand, you guys got to unmute because if it's funny, I want the people to know that it's funny. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Wait, I haven't muted. I was just suppressing a lot. I mean, yeah, I, I remember mean... when that came out. Oh my God! Oh, so. Due respect to Tyler, he's such a bright guy. But so, whoa, so that's I a mean, contorted uh, argument. Yeah, it's really something. It was like America would actually sacrifice for Taiwan because, like, we didn't bat an eye at a million people dying. There are holes in that. It's an interesting <laughs> thought experiment, though, because I think one of the things that the CCP talks about very explicitly is the need for sort of national sacrifice and yeah. making decisions that are in line with the party. But uh, as you say, Adam, like when push comes to shove. How how far are folks willing to go for this sort of thing? And then you get to the question of what makes societies soft? Is it crossing $20,000 GDP per capita? Is it not having a war for 50 years? Because I, I think even though it's sort of part of the national discourse, this national sacrifice in China in a way that it really isn't in the US, at least as long as I've been around, it's still an open question for me whether that sort of mobilization, which is different from the sacrifice of what ended up needing to happen in China, which was like people staying home for a few months, is something that the party can really count on in a moment. I, I, I take your point. I think it's an interesting point, And it's certainly something to think about. 
the implications of. And I do, I don't actually know Chinese society from the inside enough to be able to make any judgment as how convincing that clearly the party loves that rhetoric and continues with it. But I also wouldn't discount, think about America after 9-11. It's an all-volunteer army, sure, but certainly amongst a certain class of Americans of that period, there absolutely was clearly a desire to volunteer and to do their bit for whatever the war on terror dictated America needed to do. And there was a powerful sense of mission that motivated those men and women. And it's very striking that it involved both men and women in near combat or actual combat roles and a really rather amazing mobilization, quite absent in Europe. Even though societies like Britain sent considerable numbers of troops, the culture around the British army Army is not one that would engender the kind of volunteer spirit that you saw in the US in that period. And I, of course, really lived it only in the aftermath. But at coming to Yale in 2009, that sense of identity was incredibly powerful. And it changed the attitude of the university towards things like the ROTC. The difference, of course, is in the US, it's a lifestyle choice. We have a few million people who serve in the army. But after 9-11, Bush was like, go to Walmart. As opposed to you need to spend 20 hours a week learning Arabic because we need to like understand other cultures better or you need to. But people did. By bond. Like considerable numbers yeah. of Americans did spend that time to learn Arabic right. and put their lives on the line and thousands of them paid the ultimate price. Yeah, I think um, it's worth distinguishing the political choices versus what ordinary people choose to do. And there's, I think, looking at this sort of from a generalist perspective, I feel like saying cultures are soft or hard or whatever, you really can get in a lot of trouble with that. And they, yeah, they can I mean, change on a dime. And whether it's a democracy or an authoritarian regime, I don't think has any bearing on that whatsoever. I mean, if anything, I would say that democracies might be slower to act, but are probably more likely to be able to sustain political legitimacy for something because the perception that they actually consented to it than people being forced into something that they may not have been in favor of. I don't, yeah, that's separate from Tyler's question, but it's worth thinking cautious. about, though, the long legacies of mass mobility in World War II. For instance, sacrifice can take lots of different forms. I've always been very struck by the way in which the last great episode of collective class struggle, or at least labor struggle in Britain, the miners' strike, 83-84, the resonances in that of war-style rhetorics of mobilization and sacrifice, the language of going over the top the kind of collective geeing up, which doesn't come naturally to English people, of cheerleading and actually mobilising yourself to charge at a line of police with batons and shields and horses. And I do think that can be legitimately seen as a kind of long echo of a quite material sense of putting your body in harm's way in a collectivity. But that hasn't really persisted into subsequent decades of industrial struggle. And as, we're, as, we're, as everywhere else in the West, that has really ebbed in Britain. And would need to look at other areas where people are willing to sacrifice, other sorts of protest movement where people are willing to take very considerable risks to want to generalise about it. But if the question is, do we have a conscription era style vision that most European and perhaps some Asian societies had coming into the 20th century that it was a man's natural progression and obligation to go through a period of life where you might have to fight in a war kill and be killed that clearly has ebbed away a conscription for instance in Europe and that was a fundamental feature of state building and again if you look back to the Chinese era if we look at the early 20th century modernizers they're almost all either engineers or economists or all their military men who in the army, in various types of new model army, saw the future of the nation. The U.S. Army, I think, was smaller than Bulgaria in 1938. America long prided itself on not having a conscription culture. Right? That was for somebody like Woodrow yeah. Wilson, almost definitional of what it meant to be an American. Britain, similarly. Elder gentleman autocratic tendencies is a phrase which was coined by Jude Blanchett in last week's episode. Matt, you retweeted a great South China Morning Post article where this reporter was digging up a new book, which highlighted she expressing frustration at his officials not having internal initiative. She apparently said, some only get moving when they receive written edicts issued by the leadership and they would do nothing without such instructions. Written instructions are the last line of defense, she apparently said. If I didn't hand out instructions, would these officials do any work? Adam, where should we start with the historical echoes here? Yeah, I, I've just come off reading a bunch of stuff about Mao, late Mao period, and, and I, I had a kind of weird resonance from that, but I'm sure it's misguided, right? The late Mao period, the, the standard narrative is, as it were, there's a sort of perverse dialectic between the Soviet-style planners and the Maoist, true Maoist, bottom-up mobilization folks. And in a sense, 
hence it would seem that she has fallen foul of the ossification of the system which they so feared and now is spinning his wheels desperately trying to re-energize the bureaucracy that no one has done more than him to paralyze presumably I, I retweeted that the article was found by George Magnus and who wrote a book called Red Flags which is very good about a lot of these dynamics came out a few years ago but yeah his point was yes if you once you cow and terrify all of your subordinates into deviating at all from what you say it's not surprising they won't take any initiative and do anything unless you explicitly tell them what they should do that seems like a common problem in a lot of regimes that have this kind of structure my understanding is that one of the big innovations that Deng Xiaoping and his colleagues imposed was that because they decentralized and because they let power diffuse and responsibility down to regional and local levels they were able to maintain that dynamism and not have this centralized from the top kind of rule some problems you can only solve with lots of centralization and some problems you can only solve by pushing power down and we saw a very clear trend in his first five or six years of him seeing the centripetal forces being too powerful and these provincial governors being able to bank hundreds of millions of dollars by just doing whatever the hell they wanted and that was a big issue but to start to swing the pendulum back after you've punished millions of party members, killed lots of corrupt officials, is impossible, especially if people don't think you're going to be going anywhere anytime soon. This is basically like the revenge of Bush Eli. But surely, <laughs> for me, when you introduce a thesis like this, my immediate reaction is to check my prejudices, because it's just, it's, it fits. It makes perfect sense. It's totally convincing as a story. And then I would really want to dig and know more, whether this actually is borne out by, well, we could test it in various ways. And I don't come to this necessarily simply from the China side, thinking about the way in which the history of the Third Reich was written. First of all, we thought it was totalitarian. Then folks discovered it was a bit disorganized on the inside. And then forever after, everyone wrote the history of the Third Reich on the premise that it was fundamentally disorganized, which makes it quite difficult to understand how it managed to do all the extraordinary destruction and damage that it actually did. And so that will be my question with China as well. Okay, sure, we have this view about Xi as top-down dictatorial. We know that he could very well have intimidated large numbers of party apparatchiks through the anti-corruption drives. All makes sense. Then I want to know, okay, what's actually happening? So let's take some area where we think that a decentralized initiative was previously quite important and see whether the evidence is, and it may very well be there, but I would just like to, to see it, if you like, whether these sorts of ossification processes are setting in. So you could, I guess, adduce maybe the stimulus of last year or the lack of it as an instance of this. In 2008, the story is the diktat went down from on high, do something big, and folks really did react at the provincial level. Maybe those mechanisms aren't there anymore. I just want to know how this actually plays out, because some of the problems, some of your previous guests, Jordan, have emphasized that though at the national level, it's difficult to maintain connections, say, between Western expertise and local collaborators and national government in China at the provincial level, where since China is absolutely enormous, we're talking about entities the size of European states, at the provincial level, there's still plenty of room for action on issues like child malnutrition and so on. That's my sceptical counter. And I think right now, given the pervasive, the strength of pervasive narratives about China and its regime, I would just want that empirical check. I want to have more new co-hosts on China Talk. If you have an idea of who I should have on the show to address Adam's question or anything else that you think would fit on the show, check the show notes. There's a Google form. Make your pitch and maybe you'll be on the next edition of China Talk as a co-host. I thought this is actually apropos of what Jude Blanchett said in that session of yours. I thought he was quite striking about this, that right now maneuvering our way through the force fields of global politics in China Talk, one has, I think, to be super conscious about the way these things are influencing us, not necessarily with a sort of pro-contra China bias, but simply from the point of view of trying not to make errors of analysis, which are, and I, again, I speak as somebody haunted by having read an enormous amount of Anglo-American commentary on the Third Reich in the 30s, 40s, and then subsequently, and feeling that a lot of the time, as it were, the purpose of the narrative was in large part to confirm various things, people were, points people were making about Britain or the United States at the time, rather than actually getting to grips with the dynamics in Nazi Germany or in this case in China. I think it's a huge challenge. And for folks who've got skin in the game, whether it's in NGOs or in business or in policymaking, of course, it's even more high stakes. So, so Adam, I hear you've got some Chinese translations of your books coming out. How was that process? And uh, what was it like talking to some uh, Chinese journalists? Well, it's an honor, first and foremost, to get translated into Mandarin is not something that ever ex I expected to have happen to me. And you do have to adjust your, your expectations when they, you start talking to a journalist and they start telling you about their newspaper circulation and you suddenly realize they're talking about millions or even tens of millions of readers. So there's a real shock element to that. There was a certain amount of censorship that happened. 
strikingly largely about the Russian passages. So we're talking about Deluge, which dealt with World War I and its aftermath, where I have quite a lot of stuff about China, but also about the, the Russian Revolution, Lenin mm. features in the large. And those passages were quite heavily censored. I actually read Lenin as a very interesting thinker, but the original social media blogger, genius political blogger, but if you read Lenin's collected works, if you, I would strongly recommend doing this online. It's an extraordinary running commentary on events. But to my mind, also somebody who therefore has to deal with contingency and uncertainty and does so in quite creative ways and the censors didn't like that and the same was true about crash the bits that they edited were the bits about putin so where i again i to my mind make quite a sympathetic case for putin as the exponent of a rough and ready autonomy of the state in relation to oligarchic interests able to bang oligarchic heads together in a way that no one in western europe or the united states was able to do the meeting in the kremlin in the fall of 2008 felt very different i think to the meeting in the treasury in the same moment and that was taken out too so that was interesting the bits about china unsurprisingly perhaps in crash were were not touched. And then talking to journalists afterwards, obviously Chinese journalists come in all shapes and sizes and they're the people that I've had the privilege of dealing with are a brilliant bunch. But inserting China into the narrative of the early 20th century still remains, I think, as it were, a question and how to do it and how, especially somebody like me coming from a North Atlantic perspective, essentially US Europe, and trying as I did in Deluge to open out towards China, that remains fascinating as a question. How do we insert the period of warlordism into that history? That produced an interesting conversation, the, the relevance of the Weimar Republic, of, of Carl Schmitt's theory, which I think we spoke about on a previous session. All of that came up in conversation. And then I had another conversation rather touching, actually, with a journalist who's a European correspondent normally. She was remarking on actually how tough it's been in the last 18 months. She was curious about my position as somebody who's lived between the UK, Europe, United States all of my life and from what angle therefore one writes and she was saying how disorientated she felt by the deterioration in relations in the previous years. I've been very upfront about how disconcerting for me, really shaking in my personal identity Brexit has been and, and obviously she's experienced something in a sense even more violent and much more dangerous one imagines right in the sense that she all of a sudden faces suspicion I think from both sides but as she was describing it I sensed more from the European side that a Chinese journalist was all of a sudden just that, nothing more really than just a representative of China to whom questions were then addressed and at whom perhaps suspicions were directed. And I think that was a really sobering conversation, the way this is affecting people. And obviously, speaking to you, Jordan, there's a whole cohort of Americans who are deeply invested in the relationship with China. And it really, I thought, brought home to me how casually we talk about uncoupling and these kind of processes and the violence this is doing to people's life plans, the investments they have. One senses listening to your podcast the way you end up with great Chinese rap or hip hop or whatever, or talk nostalgically about bars in Beijing, how much you miss it. And there was something awful really about talking to her about her experience of alienation from the other side. So that that was really impressive to me. You, you just brought me from joking about World War Three to like tearing up now, Adam. It's you go on Doban and you look at the reviews that your three books have had, and just it's just so cool to me always to see folks engaging with a 700 page book that I'm sure is like not an easy read in English, and I'm sure is even harder when you're coming at this stuff with even less context in, in China, mm -hmm. regardless of missing a few paragraphs on Lenin. People are engaging with this work, it's just a really cool and inspiring thing. I wanted the little thing at the beginning, like they have on the movies in the, on the airplane, this book has been adjusted for just display on the airplane or whatever, just for my own sort of peace of mind. But other than that, absolutely. I imagine the readership are extraordinarily highly educated yes. <laughs> Chinese who know from my experience of teaching Chinese graduate students in New York, they're not lacking in context. I mean, <laughs> that's one thing they're not lacking in. It's just cool to be able to be part of that conversation in Mandarin and for the text to go through that kind of transition. I mean, I was really impressed. Apparently, one of my interviewers is a grad student I've worked with in Colombia, and he said that the Mandarin translation has come off well for Deluge. And what was really remarkable was how well our interview translated translated back through Google Translate came out in English. When you see your own words rendered in another language and then re-rendered by artificial intelligence, there's maybe a two, three percent loss, but hey, it's pretty uh, incredible. Uh, yeah, pretty incredible for the amount of two way flow that enables. Adam, you're writing this book about climate change and COVID and you got this newsletter. I kind of miss the old Adam twos. What would you be doing if there was no internet and like all you could do was write books and the world wasn't crazy enough for you to 
feel like you have to write about things that are happening right now. If you could press pause on the world, are there other 500 page 20th or even 19th or 18th century books which you feel like you have in you? And if the planet wasn't as crazy as it is now, you'd love the luxury to really sink your teeth into? For me, actually, Substack's been a way back to history. I've done a whole bunch about World War II, Vasily Grossman's extraordinary books about Stalingrad, this latest one on the Chinese hyperinflation. I'm actually setting up through Substack a return. But I don't think of it really as mutually exclusive. What I'm actually trying to do is to get the two things working even more strongly in parallel. And because foreign policy or The Guardian is not going to take a piece from me about World War II just on the spur, they need an occasion. That's the beauty for me of something like Substack is I can just do anything that I like and folks seem to be interested in. But 1929, the 100th anniversary, I'm sticking my flag in that for sure. I'm going to do a centennial history of 1929 if my life depends on it, of course. It's also the missing piece in my view of the 20th century. I've done the Third Reich, I've done the late to the early 21st century crises. Apart from the 70s and 80s, that's really, to my mind, the piece I really need to produce. And I emphatically global, so really the shtick will be how does 1929 now look when we're no longer in the world, say, of Kenneth Galbraith, or for that matter, either of Barry Eichengreen, but in the world that we will be in by 2029. That is what I'm progressively opening my horizons backwards towards. But I do think of this as Matt has a strong history background. Like, to my mind, and that's part of what I think makes his commentary so fantastic, is you can see the writing of contemporary history going on as we go along. And I genuinely don't think of them as mutually exclusive. Oh, oh, oh we didn't do any Krugman stuff. If you're talking about the LRB piece, yeah. to me that already feels a bit like the before times. So I did the Jalant Yellen, Mario Draghi piece and the Paul Krugman piece back to back deliberately because I was trying to map a new history of neoliberalism by way of the good guys if you like. I'm a little bit tired of the histories of neoliberalism that centre on Central Europe. You know, Quince Labody and Blue, the whole debate opened in an incredibly productive way but to my mind if we want to understand the development since the 1980s we need to recenter and we need to focus on the MIT people and that was the project and the project was also under the sign of the sense that something quite fundamental had shifted in the boundaries of fiscal policy in the United States in early 2020. I don't think I was entirely, or we, because there was a whole bunch of us discussing this, including Matt, like all the usual suspects. I don't think we were wrong, but I think it's also become clear that the powerful constraints are reimposing themselves, and those are in part outside of the administration, but also in part within the Biden administration. And I wouldn't write either of the pieces necessarily differently now, but they definitely feel like a little period. They do feel a little period piece right now. I'd say the bond market agrees with that assessment, I think. We can. We all had the sense of early 2021, man, there's going to be a big structural shift, and then maybe not. <laughs> but but to, yeah, to go back to your earlier point, George, that for me is the fascination of doing this kind of work now, because those were instant histories, right? Both of those were 30-year sweeps conditioned on a certain assumption about what was happening in early 2021. I'm not abandoning that interpretation, but I do think it has immediately required repositioning, and that's fascinating. No reason to give up. It's just something that's very interesting to live through and think through. Why what? Why do we need to reposition? We need to reposition because the idea that the first round of stimulus, the 1.9 trillion, I can never remember, the American Rescue Plan, I think it's called, that was the opening, and it was positioned by the Biden people themselves as the first of a series of stages which would be followed up by the infrastructure plan and the families plan and the whole thing would mount to this grand quasi social democratic transformation of the United States. We know where that's ended. In other words, in predictable. It's and- just so crazy how contingent history is where yeah. if one, it, it really it would have been like two senators not having sex scandals and that's like trillions of dollars in the balance yeah. and potentially stuff that could bend Matt's kink. I shouldn't call it yeah. Matt's kink. So that's, that <laughs> sentence has a lot of the key <laughs> words there. I don't really like how that flows. <laughs> I think it's forever after now, Matt's kink. But um, yeah, that is the nature of a matter of power in the United States right now. That is the extraordinary, terrifying, contingent quality of it. But it does depend on these wafer-thin majorities, one way or the other, that are available for some things and not for others. And who knows what the situation will be in 2022. What we do, I think, know now is that the Biden administration is not going to be able to set the field for 2022 in quite the way that they expected to be able to do. Speaking of contingencies and wafer-thin majorities, let's talk about the German elections, because I feel like that's a situation where, again, you could have a narrative of a big change, and it seems like that's dwindling rapidly, where the green were in the ascendancy and now it looks like you're going to have some kind of another boring grand coalition but with a different junior partner. What is your view of that, Adam? Let me just very briefly bend the previous discussion back to China in the sense that one of the really fascinating things about the Biden 
second phase action, right, the infrastructure plan and, and the families plan, notably the infrastructure plan, though, is that they were sold as climate and China as the big challenges, the historic challenges the Biden administration was going to address. And a lot of us were upset by that, frankly, that you should position the infrastructure program in relation to China. At least, however, we were persuaded that if you did this, you'd actually get some bucks for your bank. You would actually be able to cash this out in terms of higher spending. But what we've seen with both that appeal and the Endless Frontiers Act is that there's a lot of China hostility. There's a lot of upping of the anti-China anti, but not a lot of actual cash out in terms of transformative expenditure. So this takes us back to the earlier conversation about sacrifice and the seriousness with which America is actually even capable of embracing this notional grand strategic historic competition. The politicians like talking that talk, and it's one of the things they can actually agree on on Capitol Hill, but it's quite unclear when it comes to actually shelling out money, the prevalent constraints of the United States in 2021 don't bind. On the German election, again, from a China angle, this is quite significant, right? Because we started the year with overwhelming consensus. It was really striking in the wake of the comprehensive agreement on investment that Merkel and Macron are accused of having forced through, bounced through in December last year. There was this overwhelming commentary, especially in the Anglosphere, about the end of the Merkel era of appeasement. She belonged to the old historic zone where Germany was business driven in its policy towards China. That was all over now. And part of the reason it was all over was the Greens were coming in. And the Greens are, believe it or not, amongst the German parties, the most hardline on China and Russia. They twin human rights agenda with a hostility towards certain sorts of fossil fuel, carbon fuel intensive businesses. The fact that BASF and VW are hugely invested in China doesn't necessarily make the Greens quake in their desire to push hard on Hong Kong and Xinjiang, though the Greens in Baden-Württemberg are heavily invested in their relationship with German business as well. In any case, there was a consensus, especially in Germany, that that's the way things were going. And one of the parliamentarians, European parliamentarians that the Chinese sanctioned over Xinjiang is after all the green speaker of the European Parliament on China issues. So there was a sort of clear idea of where things were going. And Laschet was thought to be weak precisely because he was some sort of Merkel clone. And of course, now the opinion polls have swung the other way. So there's every reason to think that the CDU will hold the whip hand in an eventual coalition. And I would expect that also to have the consequences for their attitudes on Russia, for their attitudes on China. I think we're getting a more continuity German government in that respect as well. We don't know yet. We've no idea how the ministerial seats will be distributed, but it's very unlikely that the Greens will be in a position to demand the foreign ministry, for instance, as one of their key agenda items. Matt and Adam, thanks so much for being a part of China Talk. I promised I would read your iTunes reviews. Emma Bates says, really smart, makes boring stuff interesting. Five stars. If you want an inside look at all the reasons behind China policy and tech industrial decisions and failures, this is the thing to listen to you. It's ad-free, so we'll ignore the smush editing. Well, not ad-free for long, but uh, the editing will get better, I promise. Jarnold Palmer, surprisingly fun, five stars. Jordan is very knowledgeable and has a bizarre amount of background information on specific areas of China tech policy. I have a hard time trusting him because he is not a Brookings Fellow or Ivy League's professor, but his guests are all super knowledgeable, so I let it slide. Oh, and he occasionally swears, so that's pretty great. Editing is a bit rough. Fair. Sean in Seattle. China, China plays an important role at this point in our history, bridging interests, voices, and minds between civil society, private enterprise, and government public service sectors. We all gain in untold and unseen ways from Jordan Snyder's labor of love. Why, thank you, Sean. Um, anonymous reviewer one says, most anti-China guests and content, one star, not China talk, it, it's US talks China. Um, fair, I guess. Uh, CB0148, China Talk is pretty good for stars. I really enjoy this program, particularly in its focus on the intersections between China tech and politics. However, I have two points of feedback that I think would really improve the podcast. One, please engage more, f more women panelists and experts. There have been strings of episodes with no female contributions, and with a platform this good as that, that's a shame. Two, balance U.S.-focused tech policy with china focused topics both are interesting and well discussed but it feels like we've been hearing less about china and more about u.s policy lately that said i am happy that this podcast exists and i like the voice the host voice contrary to other reviews uh cb0148 point taken uh gender balance is an issue which i need to and promise to in the future pay more attention to and what can i say about the kind of focus on the u.s i'm now living in america 
And, um, you know, there are certain sort of policy conversations which I've gotten involved in and, and sort of use this podcast to express. However, um, I think this review came out maybe a month or so back, and hopefully the recent spate of more China-focused stuff is scratching that itch. Not to worry, this is not going to be U.S. policy pod 